Hey you guys, welcome back to the salon, long time no see. So as you can probably discern from the title of this video, uh, we're continuing my long, long, long running series. Uh, me picking my five favorite horror movies from every year since I was born. So here we are, 1983. So I was 11 years old in 1983. And I feel like 1983 it was kind of a watershed year, I feel like, uh, in my life. I might be remembering it totally wrong because it was a long time ago, you guys. But you know what I mean? Um, I kind of feel like it was the year that I started getting more seriously into horror. And I, it was also kind of the same year that I, that sort of like started my lifelong obsession with, you know, goth, new wave, post-punk music. So I was all off into like the whole dark fantasia that, you know, still characterizes my life up until the present day. So, I mean, I had seen, read, listened to, like, lots of scary stuff before 1983, but I think 1983 was the first time I remember making, like, a conscious decision to just kind of throw myself into the abyss of darkness, like, consequences be damned, you know what I mean? So I think that was kind of the whole thing. Now, uh, so 1983, again, like all of the years prior, had some real uh, gems from which to choose my five favorites, but before I get into those, as I usually do... I'm going to shout out a couple of honorable mentions. First of these, uh, Louis Teague's adaptation of Stephen King's, obviously, uh, 1981 novel Cujo uh, was a great movie, very suspenseful, very harrowing, um, obviously about a mother and her asthmatic son who are trapped in a car, I think it was a Pinto, by a rabid St. Bernard. Um, you wouldn't really think that a story with that simple of a premise would be this good, but the acting performances and also kind of like the, the, I has to say like the poor dog, I mean, the helpless sympathy that you feel for this poor dog, um, I kind of feel like that makes it really riveting because he's like the monster, but he can't help being the monster because he's rabid, you know what I mean? Now the book actually has some chapters written from the dog's point of view, and I have to say thank God they didn't do that for the movie because that would have been really, really dumb. So another honorable mention, uh, House of Long Shadows. This is a British horror comedy, and it was directed by Pete Walker, and it actually has four horror legends. Vincent Price, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, and John Carradine all in the same movie. And this, as far as I can recall, had never happened up to then and never happened after. And honestly, like, more's the pity, because this was a lot of fun. Now, I've also, for a long time, had a soft spot for the anthology film Nightmares, which, honestly, it seemed to be on cable, like, every few hours back in, like, the mid to late 1980s. I probably saw it 400 times. Um, the second segment, The Bishop of Battle, which had Emilio Estevez in it, was kind of the story that made the biggest impression on me, but the three other stories are totally worth watching, too. I love anthologies, and... I really have been wanting to revisit this one for a long time, but I really like this one, and I feel like a lot of people don't really talk about it. And I feel like I would also be remiss if I didn't throw some love toward the classic slasher Sleepaway Camp, who obviously, you know, people are still talking about that twist ending to this day. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like that's probably the best part of the movie. And finally, for my last honorable mention, I wanted to bring up Jack Clayton's Kind of flawed, but still sort of magical. Um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, obviously an adaptation of the iconic uh, Ray Bradbury novel from 1962. Totally worth a look, uh, if really, if only for the completely indelible performance of Jonathan Price as Mr. Dark. He's like my favorite part of this. Also, and I know this doesn't have anything to do with the movie really, but I love, love, love the fucking poster for this. It's a beautiful, beautiful movie poster. It's one of my favorite ones of all time. But yeah, if you like the book, this is a pretty great adaptation of it. So now let's get on to the main event. So I feel like I've talked a lot, a lot about Stephen King adaptations in general. So I don't want to like reheat the same leftovers here. But John Carpenter's adaptation of Stephen King's killer car novel, Christine, I feel like it doesn't really get the accolades it deserves. Now, they did make some changes from the book to the movie. Um, probably the biggest change, at least uh, in my memory, was making the character of George LeBay the brother of the man who owned Christine rather than the owner himself, because in the book, like, the guy is the actual owner and then he dies later. Um, but other than that, I feel like 
the movie remains like pretty true to the spirit of the novel and i really like like a lot of the grisly deaths they have in this too and like the special effects in this are actually like really good probably my favorite part about the movie though is keith gordon um who stars as arnie cunningham he is outstanding i love him in this movie so much um, and he just starts out, he's just so believable, like, the whole time. He starts out as, like, this scrawny, bullied nerd, you know, with the tape on his glasses and everything like that. And, you know, obviously over the course of the story, he becomes just consumed with fixing up this red 1958 Plymouth Fury that he soon discovers is possessed by an evil spirit and also kind of had it, has a mind of its own and can, like, repair itself and stuff, which is pretty handy, you know, <laughs> now, that, now that you mention it. Um, so yeah, so I kind of feel like Arnie's just this slow transformation from this just skinny, browbeaten geek into this like scary, haunted, violent, like psychopathic greaser looking dude. I mean, that's amazingly done. And I just like Keith Gordon really fucking sells it, at least in my opinion. Um, he just makes the whole transition like completely believable. It's great. Um, and I especially really like um, kind of there are all these spooky shots of this just his hollow eyed face like behind the you know dashboard like he's driving Christine and like just the lights from the dashboard are like lighting up his face and he looks all like fucking sinister. I love those fucking shots so much. Also got to say John Stockwell is great in this. Um, he plays Dennis who's Arnie's best friend and he's just kind of this likable all American like aw shucks kind of jock dude but he's like really nice and he's really charming so i can't i kind of feel like that plays really well against arnie's uh you know just deteriorating mental state and you and even though they're kind of like completely different social types it you know their friendship is still believable so i think that was really well done too also um i absolutely love um robert's blossom in this as george LeBay. he is creepy as fuck and actually if you've never seen it i think i might have talked about it on one of my past videos in this series but he actually played an ed gein like character in the movie deranged like from i think it was 1974 and he's fucking great in that but um but yeah so he plays george LeBay in this and he's fantastic and also i love um robert prosky who plays will darnell like the foul-mouthed uh garage owner who has like easily some of the best lines in this whole fucking movie and even like all the bullies are good too like i really like um the guy that plays buddy Rapperton. like he's fantastic william ostrander is i think his name like i always feel like christine is one of those million stephen king adaptations that came out in the 1980s that got like pretty positive reviews and like got pretty good box office like at the time but then as time went on like it kind of got lost in the shuffle and like people don't really talk about it that much and i feel like that's a dirty shame like in this case specifically because this is easily one of my favorite stephen king adaptations i've seen it a bajillion times i have a framed poster of it like right over there on my wall um and it's just way way better than people give it credit for i feel like So this is definitely among my favorite vampire movies of all time. I'm not a huge fan of vampire movies, but I do have, you know, some that I really like. And this is way up there, like easily top three. And I kind of feel like this is another horror movie that doesn't get brought up as much as it should. Now, I did do a video on this movie before. Um, it was quite a long video, like on this channel like a while back so i'm trying you know i don't want to like repeat myself too much here this is a great great movie um tony scott directed it obviously ridley scott's uh, brother tony scott has sadly passed away um but he just made this just really elegant very stylish adaptation of this 1981 novel by whitley streber and this movie is just not only gorgeous to look at but it kind of explores an interesting angle on vampire lore coming at it from a slightly more scientific uh pov and you don't really see a lot of stories about that i mean i think this was like a really original take on vampires which is probably one of the reasons that i really like it so Catherine deneuve is in this and she is just like impossibly beautiful i don't even know how someone that beautiful exists but she does so she's in this and she plays miriam blaylock and she's a vampire who's like thousands of years old. Like they show her like in ancient Egypt and stuff like that. So, you know, she's like been around, you know what I mean? But, you know, now it's the 20th century. She's living in this absolutely stunning like Manhattan brownstone that's just like full of all these antiques. It's just like, oh, 
I just wanted to live in that fucking house. Like, I know I couldn't afford it because it's probably, like, a billion dollars. But it's, like, especially in today's market. But holy crap, like, when I was watching this movie growing up, I was like, that's my house. I just want to live in that house. But yeah. So, Miriam, she's been on kind of a lifelong, a very, very lifelong uh, quest to find, like, a human companion that she can turn into a vampire who will stay with her forever. Now, I can't remember. I read the book, too. I actually like the movie better than the book, but the book does go into more of Miriam's, like, backstory and stuff, which I thought was kind of interesting. But see, I thought... I don't remember if she was actually made a vampire. I think she was just kind of, like, a vampire. I don't even remember where she came from. But she's trying to, like, make other vampires, like, human companions, because she wants love, you know what I mean? So she wants one that will stay with her forever. But up to this point... She's failed, like, with every companion that she's tried to hold on to. So her most recent partner, his name is John, he's played by David Bowie. Again, like, this movie is just, everyone in it is gorgeous, all of the sets are gorgeous, it's just beautiful. It's just, it's disgusting, like, how beautiful it is. So David Bowie, or John, that's the name of the character, he's been with her since the 18th century. But after 200 years of them being vampires together and hanging out and having a good time, he starts to age really rapidly now it's implied well not even implied but they i mean it's basically they tell you that this has happened to all of miriam's past lovers as well what seems to happen is that after a certain amount of time 200 years 300 years something like that the human and vampire blood they don't really play well together anymore they become like incompatible so age just starts crashing in all at once like just over like a few days you know what i mean now, the most horrific aspect of this, which I feel like you don't really get the full, um, you know, effect of it until you've, like, seen the movie once, uh, like, a couple of times, is that Miriam's lovers are immortal. They don't die, but they're not forever young. So, in other words, they're still alive. All of them are still alive, and they're all suffering horribly because their bodies are, like, deteriorating. Because she keeps them around, you know what I mean? She has, like, all of the... She has all of them, like, coffins up in the attic because she can't let go of them. And so they're all up there just, like, kind of rotting and be like, hey, this sucks pretty hard because they're all still alive, you know what I mean? And it's like, when I saw the movie the first time, I don't know if the import of that, like, really, you know, got through to my brain. But, like, subsequently as I've watched, I'm like, oh, my God, that would be, like, fucking horrifying. It's like a fate worse than death, you know what I mean? So at this point, she's kind of hoping that modern medicine will come through in the clutch and provide a solution to this. So as John starts to age, she um, approaches, you know, a very respected um, gerontologist, you know, somebody who studies aging, whose name is Dr. Sarah Roberts, who's played by Susan Sarandon. Again, gorgeous people all over this movie. Um, and she's actually been doing research into reversing the aging process. However, along the way... Uh, Miriam, I guess, is just kind of like, well, I guess John's, like, on the way out because he just, like, starts aging and they can't really do anything about it. So she starts setting her sights on Sarah as the next companion. So, yeah, the hunger is just kind of like all of the wonderful excesses of gothic, like, made manifest. Like, this has, um, Bauhaus in it, you know, the goth band doing Bela Lugosi's Dead. At the very beginning, there's, like, a club scene. Um, there's just scenes of just, like, gauzy curtains, like, blowing into darkened rooms and, like, doves flying around. It's fantastic. I love it. Just, like, candlelit rooms and, like, all these creepy statues and all that other kind of stuff. There's just, like, all these flashbacks of, like, ancient Egypt and 18th century France with everybody with the wigs and everything like that. It's great. I love it. It's, it, it, you know, I like I said, and I think I mentioned this on my other video, that I feel like one criticism of this that I saw a lot, particularly at the time that it came out, was that, oh, it's style over substance. It looks like a music video, blah 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 And I'm just like... Like, you say that like it's a bad thing. I don't really understand, like, that criticism at all. I'm like, yeah, and <laughs> it's awesome. Um, but, yeah, it's just, like, a really a beautiful movie. It's super tragic um, because Miriam Blaylock is a monster, but she's, like, a sympathetic monster, too. You know what I mean? They're all kind of sympathetic. Um, also gets pretty gory. Like, it's, it's kind of a gothic drama, but it does absolutely have, like, horror elements toward the end. Um, and the three acting performances, you know, at the center of the story are just fantastic. And just the whole thing is just so opulent and just so sensuous. And it's just, I don't know. I love this fucking movie. And I feel like a lot of people don't really talk about it. Even when they bring up vampire movies, it's, 
you know, I, I kind of feel like it's more in the line of like an Anne Rice type of vampire movie than something like Near Dark or Blade or something like that. But if you really love gothic movies and you haven't seen The Hunger, then you need to get on that shit like immediately. <laughs> So this movie here, on paper, I feel like, the idea of making a sequel to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, which is an impossibly iconic horror movie, right? From 1960. And even just coming up with the idea to do that, you'd think that everybody would be like, fuck no, man, what are you doing, bro? You can't do that. I mean, because they're like, what more could there be to add, really? And the thing about it was that, you know, the guy that wrote the original novel, Robert Block, he actually wrote a sequel novel, which was also called Psycho 2, in 1982. But the producers of the movie Psycho 2 weren't going to adapt that. And as far as I know, I don't remember if I ever read the book or not, but the movie is a completely different story. So they're like, we're going to write a whole new story. We're not even going to use Robert Block's book. So I was just like, okay, whatever. I guess Robert Block didn't care. But I mean, just because of all that, I feel like this project could have gone so so wrong incredibly though it did not this is a damn fine movie and it's just i just can't imagine like how that happened but here we are um the movie it kind of like works as a slasher movie but it also makes us sympathize with norman bates who's like the villain of the first film i mean it's just it's a kind of a balancing act, but it works out like really, really well. So Psycho 2 was directed by Richard Franklin. And again, you know, stars the fantastic Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates. Can't really have a Psycho movie without him, honestly. So Psycho 2 takes place in real time, 22 years after Norman was put away in an asylum for the crimes that he committed in the 1960 film, obviously. Um, now he's supposedly been cured of his mental illness and has been released. But, you know, he moves back to town. Townsfolk were not so uh, keen on having this psychotic murderer, you know, just back in their midst again, running his dilapidated hotel out on the side of the highway. So because no one is really staying there because they're like, hey, murderer. So Norman kind of has to get a job at a diner to kind of make ends meet, right? But the locals there are just constantly giving him shit, which is probably what would happen in real life. Now, he genuinely does seem like a changed man. You know what I mean? It's been 22 years. You know, he's been going through therapy and stuff like that. Yeah, he's a murderer and stuff. But, you know, he seems like he's gotten his shit together and knows what he did was bad. And he seems like he's getting ready to, like, have a normal life, right? So he's working at this diner. And then he starts receiving, like, weird notes and phone calls that are purportedly from his dead mother. And this is starting to freak him out a little bit, as it would, and is also starting to kind of chip away at the fragile sanity that he's been maintaining. And he's starting to worry that he's kind of losing it again, you know? Now, the only person in town who seems kind of sympathetic toward him is this waitress named Mary, who's played by Meg Tilly, and she works at the diner with him. Now, the pair of them develop a friendship and maybe even kind of a little bit of a budding romance type of thing, but... I mean, it's pretty clear that the harassment of the town residents, if that's indeed what this is, is starting to take its toll, like, on his mental state. So, like, Norman starts thinking that maybe he's losing his marbles again, but it's not real clear as you're watching the movie, like, is the problem that he's going crazy again, or is it supernatural? Like, is his mom, like, talking to him from beyond the grave, or is there something else going on? <laughs> So yeah, I mean, Psycho 2 is just, it's a great expansion of the character of Norman Bates, like I said, kind of casting him in a more sympathetic light. And it's also kind of like a twisty mystery, which I thought was kind of cool, which, which like I said, but overlaid with a little bit of a slasher kind of thing going on too. Um, and again, like Anthony Perkins is fucking great as Norman. And I like that we have like another dimension of him. Like he's an older and wiser man in this movie, and he's just trying to get by in the world and he just keeps getting unwittingly like thrust back into his past like when he doesn't want to be um but yeah this is a great movie way better than it had any right to be and honestly it more than lives up to the legacy of its predecessor gonna say too that like Seiko 3 and Seiko 4 also decent i mean they're all like good movies which that hardly ever happens in horror franchises but i think this is one of the rare exceptions that um all of the movies are good So, 
everybody, I mean, anybody who's been around here for any length of time, you know that my love of horror anthologies, I mean, that's no big secret, right? Twilight Zone, the movie, it's a movie that I find myself returning to, like, again and again. And this is another one that I've seen, like, a bajillion times, probably, because it was, but it used to be on cable, like, all the time back in the 80s. So, Twilight Zone, the movie, has four segments. Three of them were remakes of stories from the original Twilight Zone TV series, and one of them is an original story, which was written for the movie. So, this anthology has fucking big name directors right you got steven spielberg you got john uh john landis you got joe dante you got george miller and it also has um a bunch of actors um that were on the original series as well you got like burgess meredith bill moomy kevin mccarthy patricia berry like turning up in either big parts or cameo parts so i thought that was kind of cool like in a like sort of homage to the original tv show so obviously the movie is kind of like marred in a lot of people's imaginations because of the horrific uh, onset accident that killed the actor Vic Morrow and two child actors. Um, and there was a subsequent lawsuit that was brought against John Landis and members of his crew for negligence. Um, they actually didn't, uh, they weren't charged at the end, but it was still like fucking horrible. Like, look it up. There's a whole... You know, I don't really want to talk too much about it here because it's awful, but it's just kind of like, yeah, it, it was a bad thing that happened. Um, but despite all of that, um, this is still a really entertaining and a really enduring movie if you try not to think too much about the shit that happened on the set. You know what I mean? So the first segment of the movie is called Time Out. This is the one that's directed by John Landis and the one that had the late Vic Morrow in it. Now, this one's actually not so much a straight adaptation of an original Twilight Zone episode. It's actually kind of partially based on two different Twilight Zone episodes. One was called Back There and one was called The Quality of Mercy. So it centers around this angry, racist asshole named Bill who kind of leaves a bar or either gets kicked out of a bar like after ranting about blacks and jews and east asians and blah -de blah and like after he leaves through some magical whatever he finds himself transported back to a series of like past scenarios where he gets to experience prejudice like from the victim's point of view right like um like in the first one he's perceived as a jew like in nazi occupied france you know and you can see you can you can tell how well that's going to go, um, you know, during World War II. And then he's seen as a black man in 1950s Alabama, like he's being chased by the Klan. And then he's perceived as like a member of the Viet Cong and everything that goes with that. So the messaging here is on point and like pretty satisfying. It's pretty heavy handed, but you know, it's Twilight Zone. What are you going to do? Um, and honestly, Vic Mora's performance in this is so great and like so committed that I really didn't mind one bit. I mean, obviously he's kind of like a cartoon villain, but I have known people like that in real life, so it's not really that exaggerated. Um, now, seeing the helicopter sequence in the Vietnam portion of the segment always like kind of bums me out. It makes me sad because that's when Vic and the kids were killed. But, um, you know, it's still a good story regardless, even though, like I said, it's slightly, the messaging is slightly heavy handed, but that's okay. So the second story is called Kick the Can. And this was directed by Steven Spielberg. It's probably my least favorite just because it's a bit on the treacly side. It's not really a horror story, but that's not really to disparage it too much because it's still pretty solid. And I really like all the acting performances in this. So Scatman Crothers, who I fucking love, um, you know, he's my favorite and he's like probably one of my favorite parts of The Shining as well. So he plays a character named Mr. Bloom and he has newly arrived at this kind of retirement home. And he immediately piques the, the interest of all the other old codgers at the place by telling them, basically, even though, even though all of you have one foot in the grave, pretty much, you can still have fun and enjoy life. So he actually invites them all to sneak out into the yard, like that night after everyone's gone to bed, and they're going to have like this a spirited game of kick the can, which they all used to play when they were children, which seems like a boring game, but you know what I mean. You, you had to do what you had to do back then. <laughs> So we have a can, let's just kick it around. So everybody agrees. They're like, okay, that sounds like fun. Except for one pinched old fart named Conroy, who thinks they should all just act their ages and is kind of a killjoy dick about the whole thing. Not gonna lie. And then, surprise, surprise, when all the little grandpas and grannies get out on the lawn for the shenanigans, they discover that they have all very literally and physically been transformed back into children by the magical Mr. Bloom. Yes, it's the magical Negro trope. 
Now, as kids, they have just a great time playing jump rope and jacks and whatever the hell, like, old-timey games they're all into. But soon enough, like, they kind of run around and play and everything. But then reality starts to set in um, because they still have their minds, like, their, and their memories and stuff. They're like, well, wait a minute. Like, we're all kids now. Like, who's going to raise us? Like, where are we going to go? Like... You know what I mean? It's like, our parents are all dead. And it's just like, you know what I mean? It's like, do we have to go to school all over again? It's like, do we now have to watch our adult children and our grandchildren die because we're young? It's like, this kind of sucks. So, you know, obviously faced with these realizations, um, most of the kids like opt to return to their normal ages, you know, kind of realizing they don't have to be young to be happy, which I guess was the lesson that Mr. Bloom was trying to teach them. Now, the only exception to this is Mr. A.G., who's played by Murray Matheson. And he was kind of a mischievous child at heart type person, like even as an old guy. So he's absolutely ecstatic to be a kid again. He just can't get over how awesome it is. So he just like swashbuckles like off into the night like Peter Pan. He's just going to make his own way and grab life by the balls. And I was just like, you know, more power to you, man. I mean, it does help that he's like in his mid-teens because some of the other ones, when they turned him into kids, some were like little, some were like six or seven. Like, obviously, they wouldn't be able to live on their own. But Mr. A.G., like when he gets turned into a kid, he's more like a like 15 or something like that. So it's like, eh, he'll probably be all right. So crabby old Conroy, uh, predictably, you know, he was the one that didn't want to come out. He's like, fuck that. I'm staying in bed. You know, he was like that kind of dude. Um, but when he sees that it actually worked, he kind of realizes the opportunity he missed. So he begs Mr. A.G., take me with you. You know what I mean? I want to be young, too. But A.G. is like, nah, bro. <laughs> He's not mean about it. But I was just like, man, I wouldn't want that crappy old fart around either. Um, but Conroy does learn the same lesson. Like, that he can still be silly and fun and enjoy himself, even though he's old, which, you know, is nice. Now, the third segment is easily my favorite. It has some great, great, like, creature effects. Rob Bottin did them. Like, um, you know, obviously he did the thing and a million other things. So it's called It's a Good Life, and it's based on the original Twilight Zone episode of the same name. So this one was directed by Joe Dante. Uh, the story was originally by Richard Matheson. So this is about a teacher named Helen Foley, who's played by Kathleen Quinlan. And she meets this mysterious boy named Anthony when she accidentally, kind of, he sets it up, um, hits his bike with her car in like a diner parking lot. So Helen gives Anthony a ride home, and when they get to his house, which is like this odd looking mansion, kind of, like in the middle of nowhere, she notices something real weird is going on with Anthony's family. Like they act really sketchy and really nervous and like overly friendly and super accommodating, like to the point where it's like desperation, you know what I mean? She's like, what the fuck is up with these people? Um, Helen also notices that all the TVs in the house are playing cartoons, even the ones that the adults are watching. And then like they invite her to dinner and they sit down and they're the food they bring out is like hamburgers with peanut butter on top and like candy apples and shit like that. And Helen's like, what the fuck? And she's like, oh, I know it's Anthony's birthday. Like, and you guys are having birthday dinner and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, and they don't know what she's talking about. But it turns out that uh, the truth, what's actually going on is a lot more sinister than that. So just like in the original Twilight Zone story, Anthony has the terrifying power to make anything he wishes for come true and i do mean anything and since he's a kid with all the selfishness that implies anyone who doesn't go along with whatever the fuck his random whims are is in for a bad time now it turns out that none of the people in this house are his actual family his actual family um it's implied he either killed or maimed or sent into another dimension or something like that they're all gone basically um these people in the house now are just random people that he lured here much like he did to helen um and he basically keeps them in line through the fear that he'll do something horrible to them that's why everybody's acting so nervous and sketchy because they don't want to piss him off or who knows what he'll do you know what i mean um like at one point uh, he, his sister, who's not really his sister, but, um, her name's Ethel. She's played by Nancy Cartwright, who, fun fact, does the voice of Bart Simpson. She, like, 
tries to get Helen to help them, like, you know, gives him a note, like, help us, like, Anthony's a monster, like, get us out of here. And Anthony finds out about it, and he actually sends Ethel into one of the cartoons on the TV, and she gets eaten by a dragon. So there's that. Um, And at some point in the past, they kind of show this earlier, he had also crippled his real sister, Sarah, um, and took her mouth away so she couldn't nag him anymore. So Anthony is... um, clearly no one to be fucked with or he will end your shit. So Helen, who, like I said, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned, but she's a school teacher and she manages to convince uh, Anthony, who's kind of a brat, that he can actually learn to use his powers for good. And after he sort of sends everyone else away, she agrees to adopt him to like help him be less of a shithead. You know what I mean? Now, this is incidentally a much happier ending than the original Twilight Zone episode where it was implied that Anthony was just going to continue fucking shit up and wishing people into the cornfield whenever they did something to piss him off, and there wasn't really a damn thing anyone could do about it. So there's that. Um, Another fun fact, Bill Moomy, who played Anthony in the original episode, turns up here in a cameo as one of the guys in the diner at the beginning. So I thought that was kind of neat. So the last story, directed by George Miller of Mad Max fame, uh, is a reboot of the classic Twilight Zone episode, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. And it follows pretty much the same plot beats as the original. Uh, this time, though, we have the completely unhinged uh, John Lithgow, who's, you know, in the role that was originally played by William Shatner. And I have to say, in this version, the monster on the wing of the plane looks way better. Like, because it, it looks more like an actual slimy, scary, gremlin-type creature Uh, The monster in the original one looked a little bit like a guy in a deformed gorilla suit, sort of. So I feel like this story has so penetrated the zeitgeist that I feel like everybody knows this story, like, even if you haven't even seen it. Um, But if you haven't, uh, if you don't know this story, it's basically about this guy who's a very nervous flyer, which I relate. Uh, His name is John Valentine, and he's kind of forced to get on a plane, you know, against his wishes uh, to go to, like, a conference or something like that. So the cabin crew are, like, trying their best to, like, chill this dude out, but he is just, like, anxious to the point of distraction. He's just, like, sweating and everything like that, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm feeling that, bro. I feel it. Um, So not long into the flight, there's a really bad storm comes up, and that obviously doesn't help his mental state at all. Um, But then, really not helping matters is when he happens to glance out the window and sees what is very clearly like a humanoid monster on the wing of the plane fucking with the engine. Now, of course, nobody believes him about the creature or the danger that they're all in. And I like a lot of the really good tension of the story comes from the fact that we, as the audience, know that there's a gremlin out there that's pulling all the shit out of the engine. He's going to crash the plane, but nobody else on the flight ever sees it. And they think John is just losing his shit and just going crazy and that he's the and that he's where the danger is coming from. So, I mean, John Lithgow is so good in this story. Um, He's just going from, like I said, kind of sweaty and mildly jittery to just full blown deranged, like as the gremlin and the storm are just like whirling around outside in this horrible hollow defenseless tube in the sky. I mean, like I said, I'm terrified of flying myself. So this segment always gave me like really bad heebie jeebies. Um, but it's funny too. You know what I mean? Even though it's also like horrifying, it's just like a great story all around and it's a classic episode for a reason. And you can totally see why they remade it. I also feel the need to, Uh, shower some more love on the wraparound story, which I don't think I mentioned earlier. Um, It's basically just Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks, and they're like driving on a deserted road late at night, going someplace, I don't think they ever say, listening to Creedence Clearwater Revival, and they're playing a guessing game about TV theme songs, which actually that always kind of cracked me up. Like they're trying, they're like humming theme songs and like trying to guess them and stuff. And I don't know why that just amused me so much. Um, but then, so that goes on for a little while. And then uh, Dan Aykroyd basically asks Albert Brooks, hey, you want to see something really scary? <laughs> and this goes from there. Oh my God, it's so good. And honestly, that's like a pretty scary, like when he turns around, his face is all scary. Like, I think that was like a really well done thing. Now I'm going to say, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, Maybe, maybe I don't want to say this, but after Creepshow, I mean, Creepshow is my favorite horror anthology of all time, but after Creepshow, this might be up there. This might be my favorite after Creepshow or like at least the top three, top five. Um, I mean, it could be argued that at least one of the stories, Kick the Can, isn't technically horror. Really, none of these are like, 
I don't know. I kind of feel like the three of them are, are horror stories. Kick the Can, not so much. It's more like magical realism, but that's okay. I mean, I'm not that worried about it. Um, and I still love this movie from start to finish, and I've seen it so many times that I think I probably have it memorized. So I have to say, 1983, this list would not be complete without a heaping helping of good old David Cronenberg. Now, Videodrome is probably his best known and most iconic film. I feel like the most Cronenbergian Cronenberg film. Even though it's actually not my favorite Cronenberg movie, I think probably that honor would go to either The Brood or Dead Ringers. I'm not really sure. It kind of goes back and forth day to day. Um, but Videodrome obviously is straight up classic in pretty much every way a film can be. Now, at the time it came out, it was a notorious box office dud. Uh, it made less than half of its $6 million budget back. Kind of blows my mind that this was made for $6 million. Because it wasn't even $6 million. I think it was like $5.8 million. Like, considering, like, all the cool, like, special effects and the visuals in this, it's like, that blows my mind. Um, but the thing about it, okay, so I guess it's not too surprising that this was kind of a bomb. Um, like most of Cronenberg's movies, this is weird as fuck, you know what I mean? Um, and it understandably took a while for audiences to kind of catch up with how brilliant it is, you know? And I kind of feel like that happened with a lot of his early stuff. So James Woods is great in this. So he just plays this sleazy, smirking shithead named Max Wren. And he's like the president of this kind of struggling UHF TV station in Toronto. Now, so Max, he's kind of always on the lookout for the next kind of scuzzy, exploitative programming that'll, you know, bring in more viewers and more ad revenue. And so to that end, he has this guy who works for him whose name is Harlan, and he goes through all of these broadcasts from illegal, they have like illegal satellite dishes. And so they're hoping to find like some juicy foreign smut or like some real violent content to like show on the channel to get people to watch it. So one day, Harlan comes across this program called Videodrome that supposedly comes from Malaysia. And it appears to show people being dragged into this red room and then kind of graphically tortured and murdered. Now, Max does not actually believe this is a real snuff show. He thinks it's kind of just like a horror thing, you know what I mean? Um, but he's intrigued by it, nevertheless, and he just is itching to start broadcasting it on Civic TV. This is exactly the kind of thing that he's been looking for. This is on the cutting edge, you know what I mean? Meanwhile, um, he's also taken up with this mysterious woman who he meets on a talk show, whose name is Nikki Brand, who is played by uh, the gorgeous Debbie Harry. Now, Debbie Harry, uh, or Nikki Brand, rather, uh, is into some kind of light S&M. She likes to get burned with cigarettes and stuff like that. And he shows her some tapes of Videodrome, and she is all about it. She's really into it. Um, so after a while, she tells Max that she's going to Pittsburgh, because that's the show doesn't actually come from Malaysia. They use, like, all the, this technology to, like, make it seem like it was coming from there. But it actually comes from Pittsburgh. She's like, oh, I'm going to Pittsburgh, and I'm going to be a contestant on this show. Not surprisingly, Nikki disappears not long after this. Um, and as Max starts looking further into Videodrome and kind of what it represents, shit starts getting weirder and weirder. Um, for one thing, the torture and the murder that portrayed on the show um, is confirmed as 100% real. For another thing, um, the show actually carries a signal that can give malignant brain tumors to anyone who watches it. So this technology, um, as he investigates further, was developed by like a media theorist type guy named Brian Oblivion. But it ended up being co-opted by his business partners for nefarious purpose. Like in other words, this show, it's, you know, it's torture and murder but it also gives you a malignant brain tumor because they wanted it to kill the kind of person who would watch this kind of thing. If that makes any sense. Now, Brian Oblivion has since died, but he has a daughter named Bianca, and she kind of curates his continued media presence. Like, she releases tapes of her dad that he recorded before his death because he's got, like, a bajillion of them. Um, to kind of give the illusion that he's still alive. And also, like, he had a theory where it didn't really matter. Like, he is still alive because all these tapes still exist, you know? So as the signal from Videodrome 
like starts warping Max's mind, all kind of crazy shit starts happening. Like Max develops this vagina like slit in his abdomen that, you know, that him and other people like stick VHS tapes and guns and shit into. Um, at one point, Nikki's image appears on Max's TV and like her lips bulge out of the screen and like enfold his head. Um, later on in the movie, like Max's hand like morphs into a flesh gun as it does. Um, and he uses that to assassinate a bunch of people at Civic TV because at this point he's kind of been brainwashed and now he's under the influence of the Videodrome producer whose name is Barry Convex. Now, finally, though, toward the end, Bianca is actually able to reprogram Max in order to take out Barry Convex. And also Harlan, who is actually secretly working with Convex from the beginning. He was the one that said, hey, I found Videodrome, you know what I mean? But he did it, like, all on purpose. David Cronenberg said that he got the idea for Videodrome originally from the random American TV broadcast that he would pick up occasionally when he was a kid, like in Canada. Um, and he said well, there was always this kind of like fear or maybe like anticipation that you would accidentally see something that you weren't supposed to, like something really disturbing. So from this kind of little kernel of a concept, he sort of crafted this really bizarre, like very thematically rich sci-fi horror film that kind of touches on a lot of different things like media manipulation, like the fine line between simulation and reality. Uh, the blending of violence and eroticism, maybe like the effects of technology on the organic like human body. It's kind of considered, uh, you know, as far as I am aware, like Cronenberg's best film or one of his best films. And it's honestly, it's always the first one that I recommend to people who are new to his work and want to get an idea of his style. Because I'm like, if you watch Videodrome and you're like, yeah, I want more of that, please, then you'll probably like be way into his other stuff too. If you see that and be like, no thanks, then you're not going to like any of his shit, other shit either, you know what I mean? Um, and honestly, Videodrome, every time I watch it, I see something like different in it. And I think that's like really a mark of great art, obviously. Okay, so 1983 is a wrap. So keep watching this space for whenever the fuck I get around to doing 1984. It'll probably be a while, you know what I mean? But, you know, this is a fun series to do, but it does kind of take a long time. So thank you, as always, for watching. Remember, like, share, subscribe, comment, and all of that good stuff. And until next time, goodbye. Mm -hmm.